Hi, and welcome back to Codex. Our speaker today is Professor Carlos Cabrelli from the University of Buenos Aires. Dr. Cabrelli, Cabrelli is an expert in sampling theory and applied harmonic analysis. Today, he will tell us about frames by orbits of operators and model spaces. Take it away, Carlos. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for Joel for the introduction and to the organizer for the invitation and give me the opportunity to talk here. So uh, first, let me show a list of uh, collaborators. Um, but uh, I, I am going to talk about several uh, work that I've done, and then uh, there are many people involved. So, so the, the first I want to um, uh, give the, the motivation why we uh, study frames of iteration. So the motivation is uh, because of the problem of dynamical sampling. And the relation between dynamical sampling and frames of iteration is just given for, by this equality, okay? You should, you should assume that T is a bounded operator in a Hilbert space H, you have an unknown signal F, you have certain functions of vector GK in H, and then uh, the, in dynamical sampling, you take measure, measurement GK of the function F, and the evolution of the function f through the operator t. Uh, if you move the, the, the operator to the other side of the dot product, you see that we, we just take measurement of f using the, uh, the same function than before, but also the iteration under the, uh, the adjoint of the operator t. So in order to recover f, we need that this iteration form a frame. So then it become the problem of dynamical sampling become the problem of when uh, an operator and, it, and certain function when you iterate the operator form a frame of the space. So I'm not going to talk anymore about dynamical sampling now. So this talk is going to be about frame of iteration. So what is the connection between Hardy spaces and frames formed by union of orbit of operators? So the first time that uh, we, we see that, well, this is one connection. Maybe there is another other connection that I'm not going to talk about, and I don't know. But this, this connection appeared for the first time when we were starting with uh, Akram and uh, Ursula and a student of Akram, uh, Sui Tang. And, and then we start having an operator T uh, bounded. And we assume that was it, the first time we assumed that was diagonal, but then we, we generalized to the case of normal operators. And so we, we assume uh, that um, the iteration of this function F is a frame of the, of the phase H. So if this happened, then, and the operator is normal, then necessarily, the operator has to be diagonal. This means that, uh, and, and diagonal in this form, I mean, is uh, the sum of a certain uh, complex number lambda j times the projection, the orthogonal projection over the uh, eigenspaces, and without multiplicity. I mean, the range of the projection is just one. I mean, all the eigenvalues are different. And also, uh, are complex numbers of absolute value of modulus less than one. That means that they belong to the open unit disk in the complex plane. But the absolute value goes to one when uh, j goes to infinity. So that's a necessary condition in order that a normal operator, when you iterate it, you get a frame. But the more interesting thing is that these eigenvalues, lambda j, are not, cannot be anything. It has to be an interpolate, interpolating sequence in the Hardy space over the disk. So what that means with this is that if you have any, any sequence of, uh, of complex numbers in little, little l2, then always there exists a function f, such the evaluation on f in lambda j multiplied by some, some weight is a j. This is sometimes called uh, weighted interpolation. But if you in place to take a k in L2, you take a k in L infinity, 
And then there always exists a function f in h infinity. And you, you can remove the weight there, and the values of the function is just h i. This is a, only a, a normalization factor. Okay, this is uh, was uh, our first work uh, in a paper with uh, Akran, uh, Molter, and Tang, and also the much later in, in Aldrubi and Petrosian uh, considered the normal case. So this is the first time that the, that uh, the Hardy space show up in this uh, uh, environment. So, but what an what are the key equivalents of uh, lambda j to be interpolating? Well, this, this problem has been studied a lot in functional space, space theory, and uh, it was Carlson that uh, find a, um, a necessary and sufficient condition in order that the sequence in the open unit disk is interpolating. And the, the, the condition is the point 2i here. And, it, and this says that this infinite product is. A, bounded below. And this, what is inside the absolute value is, uh, is, a, is a metric in the unit disk that is called the hyperbolic metric. So mm -hmm. in some sense, this property, it says that the, the, this, these values, lambda k, are separated, uniform separated. So the, the set equivalence is that uh, this, set of functions in the Hardy space, k lambda j normalized by the, the norm of in the Hardy space, have to be a resequence in H2. And who, who are these kj? Are the reproductive kernel of the Hardy space. The Hardy space is a reproductive kernel given space. And the, the kernels are just these functions. For I mean, I put lambda j here, but you can put any lambda in the, in the open unit disk. And uh, you take this uh, sum that is in the hard space because the lambda j's are of modulus less than one. And so this function, when you make this, the scalar product with some function g in the hard space, you get the evaluation. So this says that this, the lambda j that are interpolating, when you take this kernel and you normalize it, it's important that you normalize it because if you don't normalize it, this sequence is not either basic sequence in, in the hard space. But you normalize it, have to be a real sequence. Okay. Okay. So uh, since I want to use uh, the hard spaces, uh, I want to introduce some notation. I'm sorry for the people that are familiar with that, but uh, I want to make it clear. So T is going to, to represent the, the unit disk, the unit circle, sorry, uh, and the complex number of absolute value equal to one, as it's the boundary of the disk. And the Hardy space is, is uh, in, in the disk or in the, I mean, is, is it the same uh, or this uh, isomorphic, the, the Hardy space in the, in the border than the Hardy space in the disk. In the disk are the analytic functions in the in the in the border are the the, the functions whose Fourier coefficients have a negative Fourier coefficient are zero. So it's a closed subspace of L two of t that have this property that the Fourier coefficients uh, with n negative are zero. The uh, other thing that we are going to to use is uh, the shift operator in the Hardy space. This is a bounded operator in H, from H two in H two. Uh, that is just a multiplication by the variable c, and it's usually called the unilateral shift because we um, we iterated forward. I mean, for for n positive, uh, and this is uh, actually an isometry. You can define the, the shift, usually is defined it in abstract, in an after Hilbert space, you take a, a orthonormal basis indexed by the natural number with the zero, and you, the shift is just to move the basis one time forward. I mean, to, to just to send the, the element i to the element i plus one. So it's important to, to mention here that the, this unilateral shift is an isometry, but it's not unitary. Okay? So 
we are going to, to look for uh, subspaces, closed subspaces of H2 that are invariant under this operator. And in 1949, Berlin characterized these, these sub invariant subspaces that, uh, from the Hardy space. And he found that uh, is any sub closed subspace, non, non the, the zero subspace that is invariant under S, is, is uh, exactly the multiplication of some function by the whole space H2, where this function has to be in the Hardy space and have to have modulus one. This, these functions are usually called inner functions. So we're also going to look at the orthogonal complement of an invariant space in the Hardy space. So this is a, an invariant space, um, and then take the orthogonal complement, and we are going to call it n sub h because it depends on h, okay, the inner function. And these are usually called model spaces. We'll see soon why these are called model spaces. Okay, so this. Uh, so far, this is all the notation I, I need for, for a Hardy space. So now we came back to iteration of operator. So we start with a Hilbert space H, and a bounded operator, and a function, and assume that the iteration is a frame of H. So then we consider the synthesis operator of this frame in H2. What do I mean by the synthesis operator in H2? Well, the synthesis operator usually you define it in the sequence space L2 of N naught. But since uh, using the Fourier transform, this is equivalent to, to H2, you can think that the, 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 the synthesis operator is defined directly in H2. I mean, to each sequence, you take the series uh, formed by this sequence and you, you, you map uh, this sequence this series, sorry, to the, to the value of the uh, synthesis operator. So what the relation of this, uh, the synthesis operator with the Hardy space is that something that was observed by Ole Christensen and Hassan Asab, uh, and they show that they actually, if, uh, if uh, an operator T uh, and a function F, is, are such that the iteration form a frame, then the, the kernel of the of the synthesis operator, look, if you look at, at the Hardy space, is invariant under the multiplication by S. Sorry, under and the, and the, the, the operator S, the multiplication by C. I mean, the care of any, any uh, frame uh, of iteration of some operator, not necessarily normal, is it's always uh, it's a inner function H and uh, the Hardy space. So this is, was a, a very interesting result. Um, and then uh, what, what you can do from here is, uh, it, as soon as you have an, 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 an chief invariant space, we now came back a little bit to, to Hardy space. Assuming that you have a, a chief invariant M, not, not uh, zero, take the model space associated to this if invariant. And what happened? Uh, if the, the shift operator uh, in an invariant space uh, leaves the, the space invariant, but not the orthogonal complement, complement. I mean, if you apply the shift to the orthogonal complement of the the invariant space, this is not invariant under the multiplication. That means it's not reducing. I mean, that does not reduce the, 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 the operator. Then what you do is just to, to apply the shift, you see F is a function in the model space, you apply the shift, and this probably take F out of the, of the model space, and then you project it back this pH is orthogonal projection over NH, so over, model, so over model space. This operator is, uh, has been studied a lot. It's called the compression of a shift on NH. And now I can say a little bit about why they are called model space, because in, in, in they, they were proved 
that this operator is in entirely equivalent to certain contractions that were very important in functional analysis. So you can you can study the, uh, these con, uh, contractions in in the hard space. In other words, the hard space serve or the model space serve as as models for for uh, certain operators. So now take uh, um, I mean, the power of C is an orthogonal basis of the Hardy space. Okay, this is, is well known. But you can see this basis as the iteration of the shift. I mean, if you take the function one in the Hardy space and you multiply by C and then by C squared and, and so on, then you get an orthogonal basis. So this is a, an example, it's, it's a simple example of the shift. Uh, that generate an orthogonal basis applied to some function. So this is a, an example of a frame of iteration and we can have in the hard space. So assume now that you project this orthogonal basis in the model space. So the projection of an orthogonal basis on a closed subspace is a parseval frame. So you can get a parseval frame in, the, in this model space, just projecting this, uh, this uh, orthogonal basis. So call phi to the projection of the function one. So you can see because of the commutation that actually if you take the compression of the shift applied to phi, that ge generates the possible frame, uh, this, this iteration adjusts the projection of Cn. I mean, you can get this, this personal frame just as iteration of the compression of the sheaf. So in this way, we now can get for any model space, a frame of iteration for that uh, model space, iterating always the same operator, that is the compression of the sheaf. So now how can you use that to, to characterize frames of iteration in abstract Hilbert spaces? And uh, this was a paper of uh, Christian Hassan Asav and Philippe. Um, Philippe uh, is now in Germany, but was in Buenos Aires uh, for, for one year. And we were working in, 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 in this problem. And then uh, um, uh, he moved to Germany and, and uh, now he's uh, still in Germany and have a, a position there. Um, so the theorem says that uh, assume that H is a Hilbert space, a, a T bounded operator, F is an element in H, and, as, and then the iteration of F is a frame of H, if and only if there exists an inner function and an isomorphism between the model space and the Hilbert space in such a way that T the operator t is similar to the compression of the shift. And the function that uh, you iterate is just uh, the, using the same isomorphism, the projection of the function one on the model space. And this, this, this uh, function applies using the isomorphism to the function f. So we have used, used uh, we are going to use this uh, notation. If you have an operator and, and a, a vector, in this, the, a, well, an operator acting in some space H and a function in H, then we say that TF is, is similar to the compression of the shift in some model space, uh, this, uh, defined by this inner function A and the function phi. Phi is going to be always the projection of function one over the model space. Okay, that uh, the, the, the way to obtain this, this result is just, we know that the, 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 the kernel of the synthesis operator is in shift invariant. So, so you take the, the orthogonal complement and restrict the synthesis operator to the orthogonal complement, you get this isomorphism. So this Q is just a restriction of the, uh, synthesis operator of this frame to the model space and H. And then you have to prove uh, that uh, this intertwining property and uh, similarity and, and this thing. And there are some commutations. 
Okay, so this uh, theorem says that every frame formed by the orbit of a bounded operator is similar to a compression of the sheaf in some model space. So I make this uh, diagram just to, to show the intertwining property. So you have here the operator T acting in, in, in some function, and that's equivalent similarity to AH here, acting here. Okay, um, this result is also valid uh, for orbits in, in, I mean, when you, when you iterate the, the, the operator uh, forward and, and backward, okay? In, in you take powers in C. Uh, in that case, the, the kernel of the synthesis operator is not H2 of T because you are going to get, uh, uh, a backward iteration, so it's going to be L2 of t. In L2 of t, the, the life is much uh, easy, and you can prove all equivalent result here, and I'm not going to, uh, to, to, to mention more about that. Okay, in this case, uh, uh, because we are in L2, we have iteration in both directions, the, 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 the kernel is just is reducing under the, the bilateral shift, which is the shift, but uh, apply in the both direction. So uh, this result that I just mentioned about the, the model spaces and the iterations operator, how relate with the, the normal case that we, we studied before? Well, in, in the normal case, remember we have this T that have this form, and this is necessary to, to the iteration of T to form a frame. And remember also that lambda j have to interpolate, and that means that this function has to be a resequence of H2. If you take the span of this resequence, now you get the risk basis of the. Okay. This is a model space because the orthogonal complement is just the kernel of the synthesis operator. So that everything works perfectly here. The only thing you have more information because you have a risk basis of, of this model space formed by kernels of the synthesis operator. So I want to mention that just this, uh, this uh, relation. So um, another thing that we can see from that result is actually that the, if you take any frame of iterations in that given space, then this frame is isomorphic to the image of this partial frame. The, that is a projection over uh, the model space generated by the function H of the, this autonomous base. I mean, it's, it's a, um, isomorphic to a partial frame formed by the projection of the iteration of C in some model space. Okay, so now, um, we want to uh, think about uh, what happens if we consider more than one function. I mean, we want to consider frames formed by orbit of several functions. So in the first moment, um, we thought that this was just an application of these results uh, to more formal frames and then take the union. But uh, you can have a frame of a Hilbert space um, formed by, by these orbits. And each orbit, that the orbits of each function not necessarily form a frame, but the union form a frame. So you cannot apply the result we already have. So this makes the things very, very complicated. We study this with, with uh, Ursula, uh, Vicky Paternostrom, Phillips, and also with a colleague here in Buenos Aires, Daniel Suarez. And we got some, some characterization. I'm not going to talk uh, too much about that, but just, just uh, uh, want to, to show what, what, what is the problem. So you want to try to find function phi sub i in H and a bounded operator that is form a frame. I here could be finite or could be countable. Um, 
what changed here when you try to do the same is the, is the domain of the synthesis operator. Now, if you take the domain, the usual domain, this is going to be uh, the product of uh, n naught and, and, and the index set, index set. And this is uh, when you try to transport this to hardy space, this is a, a vector hardy space. I mean, the hardy space of the function define it in the torus with values in little l2 of i, yes? That we are going to notate it like this. This is a vector uh, hardy space. So uh, I put here some description of the measurable function defined in the T with values in this Hilbert space, and measurable in the sense of vector functions. And, and, uh, and you can prove that F can be written as a series but now the, the coefficient of this series, we can define it as a Fourier coefficient in some sense, uh, element of the vector space L2 of i. So what are the invariants? I mean, if we try to do the same, we are going to get the kernel of the, of the, of the iterations, of the synthesis operator of this frame of iteration, it's going to be also invariant under the shift in the product space. Um, well, the invariance of a space work in the, in the case of the index set, and in the, that, in, that for us means that we have a finite number of functions. Uh, this was characterized by Peter Lacks. And, and in the case that i is infinite, then this was uh, characterized by Paul Hallmann. So Berlin, did make the proof, the initial proof for, for just uh, one, one uh, orbit, in this case, for, for the scalar hardy spaces, and lax uh, for finite multiplicity, that is called multiplicity, the dimension of the Hilbert space you put here, and Halma for the general case. Uh, the interesting thing is that the three proofs are completely different. Uh, well, the, 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 the proof of Berlin was, has been, uh, uh, now there are many proof. Uh, the original one is, is very particular because it was, uh, was a surprise, but then uh, now it's very simple proof. Uh, uh, Peter Lacks make the, the proof, not for the hardy space, just yes, for the hardy space, but on the, the se semi, semi plane. Uh, but you can uh, translate it to the hard space in the disk. And Halmas make a, uh, a beautiful paper that is called Chief on, 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 on Hilbert Spaces. It's more uh, a functional analysis proof. Uh, he, he worked with isometries and, uh, and study isometries and, and, uh, and, and he gets uh, a nice result. Okay, so, so that's what I wanted to to say about uh, the case of several orbits and, and what are the difficulties that are, uh, we are dealing with hardy spaces of vector hardy space. Okay, so now we uh, I want to introduce the following problem. And that was how we start, but then we see that actually we can uh, put it in other terms. Assume that uh, now B is a, is a subspace of L2 that is, okay, I got the word shift invariant uh, is, is in another sense, okay? Um, uh, usually we call it cis. It's, it's a subspace that's invariant by integer translations, okay? It could be also in place of the, of the group C, it could be a lattice, any lattice in an R, or this could be also, a, are n, but uh, these are spaces that you know very well, probably, and, and has been uh, studied a lot. Uh, here, tk is the translation by k, and, and, and then in these spaces, we can associate uh, 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 operator from b to b, and the natural thing, if you are working in shift invariant space, is, is a, um, ask the operator to, to uh, interact well with the translation, I mean that commute with the translation. Um, so the problem I want to, to, to uh, introduce is, uh, we want to, want to find a function in, in B, um, and a shift preserving operator L, 
that commute with translation as a chief preserving in such a way that when you iterate L over the function phi, we obtain a sequence of function in the, the cis invariant space. You want this to be a frame generator of B. What I mean by that is we mean that the, the, the translation of the iteration of phi form a frame of P. So frame generator means that the translation of these functions form a frame of P. So um, we, re we realize that actually to study this problem is, a, I mean, is, you can set it in this more general term. Assume you have a Hilbert space and you have two bounded operators. Uh, we have T to be invertible. Here the translation by one, that is the one that we iterate to get all the translation is unitary, but we don't need here to put unitary, just invertible. And uh, we ask T, yes, that uh, commute with L, L is, is another bounded operator, and we take a sequence of vectors in H, and we ask when, whether the iteration of these two operators in, the, in this sequence of function, uh, T uh, in, indexed by, by C, I mean, iterated by C, I think back and forward, L iterated forward, and I uh, a function I, if, if the, the index of the function I. Um, so this opened the, the, the question of, uh, if you have a, a bunch of operators, uh, when the, the iteration of these operators uh, form uh, a frame of H. We study in particular case that T is invertible and L is not necessarily invertible because we came from this problem that we want to study. But Actually, with, with uh, I mentioned, we're going to mention later that with uh, Victor Bailey, we are going to consider also the case where uh, T is not invertible, then T and L are um, uh, in, uh, iterated forward. And this changed the problem completely. So, uh, this all that we're going to talk about from now on is uh, from, from uh, uh, Aguilera, Carvajal, uh, uh, Vicky Paternoster. So we have to consider the same scheme than before, but now the synthesis operator is live in this little two, C times N naught times I. So let's call it E to this synthesis operator. So you have sequences of three indexes and K is in C, J is in a knot, and I is in the index set E. So that's the synthesis operator. And see, we, we made the identification to get in the, the, the hardest phase. Every time you iterate in, in, in the integers, you get L2, okay? And then we have this iteration in and not, so we have the hardy space, the vector hardy space here. In and i is a little to the i. So we have three Hilbert spaces involved here. So these are the functions. They find it in the torus whose values are functions in the hardiest the vector hardy space. Okay, so that will be the the right space for the kernel of the synthesis operator in this setting. So I, we are going to make some, some order. We are going to denote by lambda the variable of this t, and by c, the variable of this hardy space, OK? So that's, um, that's a way to, to write uh, the synthesis operator. Sorry, the, the, the identification. OK, so um, OK, we're here. So now we have two operators. So we need two operators. Uh, sorry, we have two operators, and we need to, to, to define here two operators also. So one that is to correspond to the, to the to the inversible operator is going to be uh, the unilateral, the bilateral shift U. 
this going from this space in this space and just the multiplication by lambda. Remember that f of lambda here is a, is a function in, in a variable c in the hardy space. Okay, that's the bilateral sheet. And this uh, s hat, this operator s hat, uh, act in this following way. If you apply s hat to f, and, and this is a function in L2 of I2 or L2 of I, and, and, and you evaluate in lambda, you get this is now as a function in the hardy space. So this is which function it is, is just applying the normal shift operator in f of lambda. So it's like, a, it's like the, the unilateral shift acting point-wise, okay? So you can, you can check that these two operator uh, commute. And, and the kernel of this synthesis operator is now reducing under u. It's, this means that this invariant under u and, the, and also under u star, that is the shift conjugate in multiply, multiplication by c conjugate or by the joint. Okay. And, and it's invariant under s. Here, this, this, <laughs> this hat should be on, on top of s. Okay, so. Uh, now we have this this object that this uh, 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 surface space of L two of T A two of L two of I is invariant under these two operators, and it's reducing for one and invariant under the other one. So on a normal basis of of this uh, space, it's just uh, lambda to the k, c to the j, and A I where A I is a, is a standard basis of L two of I. Uh, if we project this basis on, on, on this uh, NE, that is uh, the orthogonal complement of this uh, invariant space, and then we obtain something like before, that is uh, what we, we'll, by similitude, we call it a model space in that, case, in that setting. Okay, so you, uh, this is not. Uh, I put the key of hard work is really hard. Uh, we prove that the the if we call A to B as the compression of this operator S hat, the, the orthogonal projection of this model space. And we a phi sub i, we denote by phi sub i the projection of this model space, uh, the orthogonal basis of L2 of i. Remember that L2 of i. Is a, is a, you, can, you can think the, the element EI, I element of this L2, of this space is L2, because you can think that at constant, this value, okay, the function that in each lambda, in, and it, in each C, take the value EI. So in some way, you can think of this EI that actually live in little L2 of I as element of the big L2. So that's why you can project here over this space. So now you iterate uh, these functions phi, uh, and this is a partial frame because uh, it's a projection of a normal basis. And we prove that uh, just uh, in the same, which in the same argument that before, as you take H, T, L operator as with the properties than before, commuting and so on, and this bunch of function fi. This is similar to the, this model space, the operator, the uh, bilateral operator u, and the, the uh, compression of the, of the shift and the projection of ei to the i. So we obtain a, a, a result that looks similar, but this is, is uh, much more complicated. Here again, the, the, the similitude Q, the isomorphism, is just a restriction of the synthesis operator to this model space. And the same diagram than before. Okay, this says that if you take any two commuter operator in any Hilbert space whose orbits form a frame, they are always similar to the bilateral shift and the unilateral, unilateral shift acting, or the compression of the unilateral shift acting in some model space of L2. 
So that characterizes all the frames formed by these two iteration of these operate these two operators uh, that commute with them. So what is left now is what happened. I mean, it's, it's interesting as in the other cases. In this, this case, how we character we can characterize the subspaces that are invariant under this two shift operator. Actually, we want to characterize when I'm reducing under U and S hat invariant. And this really it took us a lot of work. Uh, assume we are doing it not for a little two of i, we just do it for k uh, 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 general Gilbert space. So we need some 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 characterization that you may know uh, that was done by Helsen and Lauderdale in 1960 that characterizes the reducing subspaces of the bilateral shift in little l two of t h. So if you take um, um, this space, L2 of TH, a subspace that is reducing under the multiplication by, by lambda, has some special form. And so this special form is the following. Uh, there exists a measurable map, and this is a, could be a little bit technical, but, but I need, really need it, uh, but maybe you uh, know uh, this this property. It's just a, a, a map that uh, uh, assigned to every uh, complex uh, number of modulo one a closed subspace of E. That uh, E is a Hilbert space that's here. Uh, in such a way, and what measurable here is uh, in the sense that uh, if you project. Uh, if you take the projection of this closed subspace, then you have a function map from T in the operator, and then you have a notion of measurability in that uh, sense. So, so this, this map has to have the following property, that M, the, 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 the space that is reducing, is exactly the functions of L2 of E that have every in every lambda is belong to the subspace G lambda. And it is, is if and only if, I mean, every measurable function that have this property have to belong to M. And every function in M have to have this property. And J is, um, uh, Helson called this J a range function in E. I, I, want to mention here that this has been used by people in approximation theory to produce frames in sieve invariant space, and then has been studied in deep by Bonick, and then there was a paper with a generalization in, the, in, the, in groups, and, um, and these have been studied a lot. And, but we, we are just using uh, these properties so far that uh, actually, what it says that is uh, actually the sieve invariant space, you can look at, at the, I mean, it's indexed, this closed subspace are indexed by T, and T can be replaced by a measured space. And in some way, it's just, just to paste together uh, a bunch of, of closed subspaces of E that actually are where, where the, the values of the function live for every lambda. Okay, so now I need the definition. Uh, what is a full Hardy space in this in this context? In this space L two of T H Q K. Sorry. As soon as you have a, a subspace of L two of T H two of K, that is U reducing and S hat invariant. So since it's U reducing, we can apply the Helson theorem, and so you have a range function. So this W is characterized by G lambda, that is a range function. Okay, so we don't use yet, uh, that is S hat in body. So we have this lemma. Assume W is you reducing a range function J and W is also S, S hat in body. Then the values, these closed subspaces that live inside H2 of K, have to be S invariant, shift invariant by this S. 
So this means that you multiply by C, J land. Huh? So like here, okay, there is a, this C should be, uh, no, sorry, it's okay. This C, remember that J lambda is a subspace of H2. So you multiply by C is still in J land. Okay, so, so you have this bunch of, of subspaces that live in H2 of K because uh, the, the Hilbert space here is H2 of K. And these are invariant under the multiplication by C. Okay, and the whole subspace is invariant under multiplication by lambda. So um, we will say that a, a subspace that is U reducing an S invariant is full hardy if this J of lambda is a whole Hilbert space, a whole hardy space. I mean, remember that J lambda was, uh, uh, in the case of S hat invariant, J lambda was an uh, invariant subspace of A2. But we, is it for full hardy, we ask to be a whole hardy space. And this whole hardy space has to be included in the original hardy space A2 of K. So E, e of lambda is a, Hilbert space contains a subspace of K and one for each lambda. And this would actually will happen is that the function that sends lambda in E of lambda in these subspaces is a range function in K. And this doesn't matter. I mean, so full hardy are the, are the, are the, are the sub, remember we want to characterize subspaces of this L2 that are U reducing an S hat invariant. So we, we have, now, this full hardy are a particular class inside the U reducing and S hat in back. So, this uh, full hardy property can be um, characterized very simple. Uh, a subspace is uh, that U reducing in S hat invariant is full hardy if and only if it's also S hat reducing. It's not only that it's reducing, uh, that it's invariant by S hat, but also. The orthogonal complement is invariant under S hat. So, so that's a particular class of, of subspaces U reducing an S hat invariant because you can have a lot of subspaces that are uh, U reducing an S hat invariant but are not S hat in reducing. So this is a particular class. So our theorem we will it will say that every other subspace that you reducing it's hat invariant. It's a symmetric image of one of these full hardy spaces. So that's uh, the, the main result. So the following are equivalent. Uh, assume that we have M and U reducing an S hat invariant subspace of this space. So this is equivalent at the, the exited full hardy space W here. Full hardy now, it's not any one. And a partial isometry Q from L2 and L2 with initial space, space W such that the image of the isometry of W is M. And Q also commutes with U and S hat. Uh, we have also. Uh, uh, unicity of this decomposition, this uh, characterization. Assume you have two subspaces are full hardy, um, and Q1 and Q2 are two partial isometries that have that commute both of U and S hat and have initial spaces, W1 and W2, and, and, and coincide. I mean, you have two characterizations using full hardy space. Then necessarily, what have to happen, happen is that there exists an isometry, the L2, in L2, a partial isometry, whose initial space is W2, that commutes with U and with S hat, and the isometry in W2 is W1. It is two W1 and W2 for hard spaces have to be one, uh, the isometric image of the other, uh, and the, the isometries are related by this property. So we have this diagram. Okay, so that's uh, finished with this unicity. And I want just to mention that with Victor, we are studying 
the case of the forward installation of two commuting operators, T, S, L, J, and S and J bigger or equal than Z. And we have already had some, some results you, you hear in some talk that he already gave uh, the codex seminar. So we finish here and thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks, Carlos. And let's see, we better stop the recording. And